Well, it's not just me and Steve Keen this week. Steve Bannister is joining us to talk about his model for climate change. Now, we know Steve Keen isn't a fan of the Nordhaus model of climate change. This year's Nobel Prize winning economist who seems to indicate that climate change won't be too bad on the economy. Well, Steve Bannister's model paints a very different picture, a more alarming picture, and he pinpoints the one variable that needs to change is the one that's hard to change. So, we need to look at alternatives when it comes to energy. That's this week on the Debunking Economics podcast. So, Steve, I mean, tell us about yourself, first of all, briefly. You know, tell us about your work, what you're doing at the University of Utah, and how you came to be involved and interested in climate change. Where did it all begin? Yes. Um, So, I was in um, private sector, high technology for much of my career, until about a decade ago. And that's actually what first led me to Utah. I was, I was at uh, a company, software company named Novell. Which, which we both know pretty well, don't mm. we, mate? Yeah, yeah, which absolutely. Was, so I, I was a director at Novell at their headquarters in, in Utah. And that, that, uh, that I got out to, uh, to Utah in the mid-1990s. And then uh, as I, uh, you know, got uh, more gray hair and started thinking about retirement, I said, I don't want to retire, but I did want to get out of high tech. So... And I had done an, an undergrad in econ decades ago and, and still loved it. Uh, and I said, gee, I wonder if I can still hang with the smart kids. <laughs> <laughs> and I wandered onto the campus of the University of Utah, uh, a very beautiful campus right up against the mountains, beautiful, mm. and um, started talking to a couple of the economists, and they were looking at me like, you're crazy, old man. But, um, but they accept, accepted me in the program. Uh, to finish my PhD. I did that. They offered me an appointment. So I'm now on the faculty there and right. teaching and doing research. And that led me, I mean, my, my dissertation was essentially on the English Industrial Revolution, which I uh, describe as primarily an energy revolution. Yeah. And that led me into the kind of modeling I'm doing and therefore into climate change. So I could see right there why you're getting on so well with Steve Keen about the importance <laughs> that uh, the energy plays in the, in the Industrial Revolution and, and beyond. But, I mean, right. you also, I guess the other thing you both got in common is, you know, uh, looking at climate change models. I mean, yeah. they're, they're pretty much uh, rooted in uh, conventional economic thinking, aren't they? If we, for example, I know uh, Steve Keen, you know, your criticism of the Nordhaus model and a lot of these models, because they're developed by economists, they're still looking for for an equilibrium. You know, we've got to, if we can find the right dynamics, we can counter them with policy, and then we can all live happily ever after. That's pretty much the thinking, isn't it? That's correct, and it's even further than equilibrium. Uh, uh, for example, the Nordhaus model and many many macro models that are in you know in the mainstream today are are uh, what we call micro foundation based They're based on max u- utility maximization by individuals, mm. you know, spread out over time and discounted back and all that kind of stuff. And all that is pretty much total nonsense from a, a reality standpoint. And the more years you're trying to project or forecast into the future, like the climate models do, the more nonsensical, uh, nonsensical it becomes. So um, you're, so Steve Keen, your issue with the, um, the Nordhaus model, of course, Nordhaus is this year's. Uh, what's going on there? I'm going to have to edit this now, aren't I? So, Steve, <laughs> so Steve Keen, your criticism of the uh, of the the Nordhaus model. And we should mention that Nordhaus, of course, is this year's Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he's right. developed his dynamic integrated model of climate and the economy, the the Dice model, which is uh, basically a bit dicey. Um, I mean, just in a nutshell, your concerns about it. I mean, it's it's the input, well, like all of these things, it's yeah. the inputs, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, 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 you know, the old story, garbage in, garbage out. Mm. Um, I mean, what you can actually say with Nordhaus, it's garbage in, uh, fan in the middle, garbage spread everywhere on the way out because <laughs> the shit hits the fan and the fan is this, uh, neoclassical growth model, which, uh, again, Nordhaus is based on the vision of a guy called, uh, Frank Ramsey, who is a 1928 mathematical prodigy who built this little model about uh, what's the optimum savings rate for an economy. And he imagined the existence of a uh, an all-knowing social planner who uh, knew everybody's tastes, knew the technology is going to evolve over time, and then could work out uh, what was the, what he called, literally called it the bliss point in the far future, where you get the, the, the trade-off between uh, 
utility maximizing behavior by consumers and profit maximizing behavior by firms reached an optimum. And the only, that happened to be unstable. So the only way to get there was to move where you were currently to get on the unstable path along a saddle. It's like you, you want to jump onto a horse. Uh, you're a ball bearing and you want to jump onto a horse. So it's vitally important to jump onto the horse from right behind its ass because if you don't do that, you'll bounce off the saddle. So the social planner worked out where to jump to and then you oscillate up and down the saddle and that's that's what gives you the trade cycle. Um, that's sheer bloody nonsense, when it, which was the foundation, but that's the fan. Uh, the shit that's fed into the fan is, is Nordhaus's assumptions about climate change and these are literally just assumptions. One is that uh, you can simulate the impact of climate change with a simple quadratic. So a one degree increase in temperature uh, it causes X, X percent damage to the economy. A two degree causes four X. A three degree causes nine X. Yeah. A 10 degree causes 100 X. And X is an incredibly small number. And why is it a small number? Because he based it on what happens to GDP when you move, uh, when, when you compare Washington to Dallas. And so if Dallas is 10 degrees warmer than Washington, the GDP is a bit smaller. <laughs> I think it extrapolates that into the, oh, my God. You know, so, so that is how you get a, uh, a, 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 a six-degree temperature rise is going to reduce GDP by 8%, which is exactly. slightly at odds with the IPCC, which says that actually 95% of the world's species are going to be wiped out. There's going to be vast amounts of methane, which are going to be released from the seabed, the consequences of which could destroy terrestrial life almost entirely. Uh, that sounds like it would take uh, more than an 8% hit on GDP to me. One. Yeah, I know. And you, I mean, you read this stuff and you, you basically think, look, I'm in Amsterdam, but they don't sell anything that good here. Uh, it is so <laughs> damn delusional. It's such fantasy stuff. Right. And so what we're both, what Steve and I are both doing is fighting a rearguard action with realism right. against this nonsense. And it involves two things. Of course, I'm trying to demolish Nordhaus and I'm building, uh, working with Matthias Rosselli and Tim, Tim Garrett, who's actually a colleague. Of, of Steve's right. at the University of Utah. We may indeed be saved by the Mormons, <laughs> uh, believe it or not. The, uh, uh, well, they're, 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 we're, we're building alternative models, and Steve is one of his own as well. Well, yeah, imagine the Normans. Mormons are, are, are not big energy users. I might be, might be wrong on that. Perhaps that, perhaps that is the answer. We all need to change our outlook on life. But, but, <laughs> the, but Steve, I'm glad you both spoke at the same time, by the way, because I wondered whether you actually were the same person, and I was just talking to... <laughs> <laughs> two voices inside Steve's head. So, uh, Steve number two. I Go mean, <laughs> tell us, tell us about a better model then than the Nordhaus model. Uh, what are the because it, it is a, obviously it is a question of what you input into the models, but but also what it does in the middle. And you don't want that fan where everything flies everywhere. So, what's what's the ideal model when we're looking at uh, modeling climate? Right. Uh, so um, the way I got to my model, let me let me explain that. I did look at the Nordhaus stuff fairly early, actually fairly early in my dissertation work. So that would have been a decade ago. He had a, a model I think he called Rice before the Dice regional, model. No, right, regional came right, after Dice. Right. So Dice came oh, first. first then right, Rice, okay, Rice is regional I had a Dice. Backwards. But anyhow, I started looking at that stuff, pulled down the spreadsheets, started looking through the calcs, uh, and I immediately went, you know, called bullshit on it and abandon it, as opposed to what Steve Keen did, which was totally deconstruct it and try to tear it down, which is extremely useful. And so I was looking for a uh, different approach to modeling, um, the, to do IPCC-style modeling, that is the economic front end to a, to a climate model, uh, that, that would be an alter a much more realistic alternative mm. to, to Nordhaus. And I happened to read, as part of my research, uh, an article that was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Uh, was nine, let's see, two, 2009, if I'm right. I think that's right. Uh, written by a group of researchers uh, led by a Japanese fellow named Kaya. And, K-A-Y-A. Yeah. And they did um, a descriptive um model, regional model, you know, describing uh, using using a certain decomposition of actual data, not not theory, Got <laughs> actual data on GDP, on carbon emissions, on and on energy consumption and on population. And and you end up you take those parameters and you uh, uh, you create ratios out of them that I describe in, in my model and in the paper you have. But essentially, they're, it's a very simple model. It takes GDP per capita, which is living standards, and 
the you know the the Kaya people called it GDP intensity because they're scientists, and then you take the um, uh, energy intensity of GDP as a ratio based on the actuals, and then you take the carbon intensity of the energy supplies all up. All, all energy sources, all primary energy sources, so both carbon-based and, and non-carbon-based, and as, a, uh, as a ratio of the uh, total energy. And you end up with those three ratios, which are descriptive. And, mm. and I have come to believe they're structural. That is, they're pretty fundamental in the system. And they how have, do they change? Because I imagine if you if GDP picked up or the intensity picked up, as they they said, then obviously we're going to start using more energy. Correct. And we'd use more carbon, but we'd also maybe get to a point where we actually start to uh, go beyond that. And we, we, for example, might start to use less coal. So carbon right. intensity is not going to increase at the same rate as energy use, for example. Right. Yeah. So the so the were my again my starting point were the the, the, the those three ratios. And then taking the actual data and calculating those at a global level since, well, since the data was set was consistent enough, which is about 1980 yeah. uh, through to recent times, uh, to do that globally, look at those results, and then decide what to do. And the results scared the crap out of me because especially on a carbon intensity, after about 2000, uh, we were doing actually pretty well in reducing carbon intensity. You know, the curve was headed in the right direction. Mm. But after 2000, it reversed itself by about a third, and we were going in the wrong direction. You know, and it's easy to blame the Chinese, and that's partially true, but it's not the entire story. But at any rate, the whole world was going in the wrong direction, and that was very scary to me. But that, so was, driven said, by, that was driven by the growth in GDP, presumably. Well, yes. Uh, so, yeah, all these things end up interacting. They're, it's a multiplicative model, right? It's a very simple model, yeah. actually. Imagine all you do is have a ratio, and this this is often done. Even Bernanke's done this at one stage, trying to find the cause of the great of the Great Depression. Right. Just use the wrong bloody ratios. Mm. Uh, so it is important to choose ratios that are correct. I'll give yeah. you Bernanke's case. He had a ratio between the amount of gold, uh, the Reserve Federal Reserve, and the money stock as if gold determined the money stock. Well, I'm sorry, he's wrong, and therefore those ratio analysis was, was incorrect. Yeah. But what is, this, this is what's called Kaya identity. So it has uh, the amount of CO2. I think it's about CO2 produced by the industrial right. system. They call it flux, which is like the, the, the flux of CO2, output. the right. CO2 output per right. year. Flow. is You can break it down to CO2 divided by energy times energy divided by GDP times GDP divided by uh, population times population. And then what you're doing is saying each of those is a causal factor. Right. Um, and then you, what you simply you do, this is a typ typical little mathematical exercise. The rate of change of the logs of all of those uh, gives you the rate, gives you a, it converts that from a, a, a definition to a statement of rates of change, which is what you're actually then analysing. And, and out of that, what you get then? You get what the impact is going to be on, on the climate out of this. Yeah. So what is the so, temperature so, change? So so the the uh, and and by the let me just uh, one brief aside to you know to support this methodology, the IPCC actually uses this methodology to to assess the various climate models that they look at. Mm. They've they've used this as a measurement and a way to compare across climate models. They did this in their what was it two thousand SRES study special report on uh, um, environmental something whatever SRES. And 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 I and what I did was I took the model, the the decompositions, the ratios, and said, why don't since I can claim and it's mostly correct uh, statistical independence between them or among them, I'll forecast those individually. Okay, the ratios, so GDP intensity, carbon intensity, and um, energy intensity, and population, yeah. And then take a population forecast. I, I don't, uh, so far, I have not separately done my own population forecast. I take typically from the UN, you know, they, re they update that uh, frequently. But I take that and then you multiply through the UN population forecast and my forecast of each of those ratios. And as intermediate outputs, what do you get? You get levels. You get the level, uh, first of all, of... Um, of GDP, total GDP, going out as far as you want to forecast. You get the total level of energy consumption. Again, over the same time period, you get the total level of, of carbon dioxide flux over the same period. 
So, so that gives you, and, and it's all based on, on uh, real data that's been forecast using the best method I'm aware of. So it's as realistic as I know how to get on, mm. on, on given data, on, you know, on actual data. And what do you find from that? Because population is going to slow, obviously. The that's more correct. The more countries become developed, we're going to see uh, that's going to slow. Uh, GDP growth, obviously, is going to increase as they become more, uh, uh, as economies pick up. But as you know, we were saying earlier, maybe at some point that carbon intensity will will start to slide as well, and the population so, is not, is not growing as much. That sounds like a good picture. It might take too long, but it it sounds like things are start not. I don't want to use the word equilibrium, but it sounds like things are starting to level off a little bit, aren't they? Well, that's correct. So, so when you do all of that, what uh, given you know, given conditional on what what population forecast you uh, you start with, but the yep. one I'm using right now, it looks like total GD, global GDP output will level off and then start declining somewhere around 2085 or 2090. Right. And before that, both energy consumption and uh, carbon dioxide output peak and start declining. Yet, while all of that is happening because of the, the dynamics in the system, the uh, living standards are likely to continue increasing. So, the, the, given the data, given the, you know, the forecasting methodology, living standards globally will continue to increase and eventually we will reach a peak of output, GDP output, and therefore resource consumption, and then start heading down. But that's at the same time that what you, what, I don't know you have done this yet. Have you looked at the temperature implications? Yes. And what are they? Yeah. So, so the, the, so, so in the long run, there's good news. It's sort of a, an inverse Keynesian situation. Phil. You're not going to tell me the bad news is, but we're all going to be dead by then. So it's too late. Oh, right? you That's- spoiled my punch. <laughs> You got it exactly. In the right. long run, we're fine. In the short run, we're going to fry. <laughs> right. So what? So what? So in your model, when? Do, where does the temperature peak then? Yeah, uh, high threes, low fours, centigrade. Right. And then, then when you then look at what the science, climate science is saying about that, and on this front, I'm you know, I'm in touch with the people who are writing these papers now because they I don't think they were aware of just how badly Nordhaus distorted their work, <laughs> um, but they are saying that a two degree temperature it will be sufficient to trigger several uh, what they call tipping elements of the Earth's climate causing a cascade that will drive us well beyond the two degree level. So once we crack two degrees or get close to two degrees, and we're not particularly far from it, even on Nordhaus's calculations of temperature change, we're 25 years away from two degree increase. It's that tight. I said, we get to that level, all these systems cascade on one another, we'll go through maybe five, 10 degree increase. And at that point, it's extinction time. But Steve, it sounds like from your model, what you're saying is that it is uh, the growth in population and therefore the, the subsequent growth of uh, GDP as, as, as economies become uh, more developed, which, you know, which is why a lot of people in the West say, yeah, well, you know, what can we do? It's all China's fault, as you said yourself. Yeah, no, well, I don't, I don't try, I try not to totally blame China. I don't, I would, if I were you want to the, blame India too. And if I were the emperor of China or, you know, the dictator or whatever he is, I would do exactly the same thing. Mm. I mean, I, I don't of blame him for, for doing what he's done. Mm. Right now. So, so the real issue in this, you know, it, when we're looking at, at carbon dioxide are, is our energy sources. And that's what's got to change because yeah. I don't think much of the rest of the system is going to change until we get to one of these tipping points, mm. which, by the way, mm. I don't incorporate tipping points in my model because I'm using actual data. So when tipping points occur in the real data, then they'll be in the model. That's how that's how yeah. my methodology yeah. works. Right. Right. But I mean, if those tipping points haven't happened yet, how do you know that? Because, I mean, that's one of your criticisms, that's isn't it, Steve, of the Nordhaus yeah. model? It, it totally ignores uh, tipping points, and I'm, I'm just- oh, yeah. Well, this, this is where the same I mean, people like the Lenton, who's the person that uh, that uh, Nordhaus misquotes. And I've, I've actually I've revised the document I'm writing. You know, the paper I've sent to patrons already uh, from guys saying that he misrepresented to say it's a lie. Uh, I just want to quote these out on on screen on you know on the on the podcast to get an idea of just how blatantly he has effectively lied about what they 
what they said. This is Nordhaus. The current version, meaning his damage function, assumes that damage is a quadratic function of temperature change and does not include sharp tipping points, but this is consistent with the survey by Lenton. Then you read Lenton's conclusion. Society may be lulled into a false sense of security by smooth projections of global climate change, which, of course, you get from a quadratic. Our synthesis of present knowledge suggests that a variety of tipping elements could reach their critical points within this century. And these tipping points are not economic tipping points, are they? They are. Oh, no. I climate, mean, yeah. they, they're climate tipping points. So, right. Right. so surely, surely they have. Yeah, they surely have to be in them because there's going to be a point, for example, where plant life starts to absorb a lower proportion of carbon dioxide. That's not a, a linear point. There's going to be points at which ice has melted and it can't melt anymore. Um, yeah. You know, so so that's a physical or, or, constraint or methane releases or, yeah. or whatever, right? So you um, haven't got those in your model, and no, no, because of my approach. I, I mean, I'm using I'm using real data, right? That's that's what's different about my model from all these others. And I always get uh, asked or even attacked saying, "Well, what about this scenario, that scenario, tipping point scenarios, and so forth?" And I go, "Look, I, I could uh, every person I talk to will give me a different scenario. How do you want me to model that, sir or ma'am?" In fact, what you could do on that. <laughs> <laughs> just to give it a bit of actually answer that question. And we're going to have a crack after we finish this yeah. conversation of putting uh, this, this Kaya model into Minsky and linking it to data as well, is that if you look at the, uh, the Stefan article, Stefan 2018, which is a follow-up to the Lenten article that, that Nordhaus lied about, uh, in that in the Lenten argument 2000, 2008, they were trying to identify uh, sort of continental-scale Elements of the the the, uh, the planet's biosphere that could be tipped, and they of course obvious ones: the Greenland ice sheet, Arctic ice, West Antarctic ice shelf, uh, coral reefs, yada yada yada. And now, having identified them back in two thousand and eight, in two thousand and eighteen, they've said, okay, these are the tipping points. These are the influences between one tipping point, tipping element, and another. And these are the temperatures at which they think they're triggered. So the Greenland ice sheet, they've got being triggered between one and three degrees Celsius. Arctic summer ice, the same. West Antarctic ice sheet, the same. Uh, and then each of these will affect others. Uh, the coral reefs, they've also got one to three, but the coral reefs don't affect anything else. So they're looking at the interactions as well. So they've come down and quantified it and said two degrees mm. is that, that if one to three is likely to cause major things like Greenland ice shelf melting, West Antarctic melting, we're talking 70 metres of ocean ultimately out of those changes, then we shouldn't get past two. Now, what Steve could do with his model, which would be an intriguing thing to add, is that with your K equation, you get a prediction for temperature. Mm. Okay. With the prediction for temperature, you could feed that back into the K model. And come up with some kind of a yeah, and say okay, or loss if, if you say that if the two degrees is the point at which it all breaks down, then you have but, one trajectory without tipping points and another with. And and again, I I totally agree, and that would be a nice extension. However, I, I've avoided doing that partly because there's so much controversy about around these tipping points. I yeah. mean, we have one article here, but but someone else will say, oh, that's just wrong. You got to do it this way, and I've just avoided that and say, look. Here's what my model says. In a sense, my model shows the best, best possible case. case. Yeah, it's going to say it's going to be more. If you put throwing tipping points, <laughs> it's more alarming. But oh, what might make it less alarming? What what about things that uh, are happening now, which, which might be influencing data? Like, for example, you know, and, and this is obviously the argument used by climate change skeptics. We've got sunspot activity. We've got solar wind activity. How much is that influencing the historic data that you're putting into your model? Well, it's all, I mean, everything is in there. So the answer is it's all there and it's all there in whatever the, you know, the statistical mix in history is. So I don't, I don't uh, focus on that very much at all. And if you're asking me to, to look at that going into the future, again, it's in the scenario space that, that I try to avoid because it just gets far too complex for, for people to digest. I mean, you get, I get arguments in audiences among the audience. When they're talking about scenarios, <laughs> they're arguing among, the, uh, among themselves. So mm -hmm. I just go, look, this is best case. And by the way, the best case is so scary in the short to medium run that we better start focusing in a different direction yeah. than yeah. most people are looking. So how far does your data go back? What's, the, what's, the, what's your history on this? Yeah, so the, the global data base that I use comes from, well, GDP data is widely available globally. 
but uh, the carbon dioxide emissions and the energy input emissions by country and therefore globally are compiled by <laughs> mainly by the, the EIA in the U.S., part of the Department of Energy. And that goes back to 1980. The complete database goes to 1980. Right. Which yeah. would, people would say is actually, quite, you know, it's a short run. Yeah. It's all, it's all, all available, but it's, yep. it's not a long time. Yep. I, if I had more data, I'd go back further. <laughs> the funny thing is, even if you do that, you're still talking about, I think, a temperature range from 0.3 above pre-industrial levels to 0.9 above pre-industrial yeah. levels. So even over that 30 of 35 years, it's, yeah. uh, it's been a sub- substantial increase in the globe's temperature. So at the conclusion is population is the key factor then. That's what we're basically saying. In the long saying. run. In well, the long run. But, Absolutely. But we need to do something in the short term, but less population. Go- Thank goodness we invented computer games because that's going to, it, from what I can tell, is going to stop us procreating. We just need to, I mean, maybe maybe, right. maybe God has given us computer games to try and save the climate. Perhaps that's, uh, if there is a God, maybe that's yeah. what he's doing. Uh, how do we, what do you do with this when you have models like this? Because there's so many models around, mm. yeah. all giving conflicting scenarios. It's, it's, and it sounds like, uh, where does yours fit in the middle of all of that? Are you sort of like the middle ground or are you one of the... Well, uh, I, you know, so I, I occasionally look at my outputs when something new comes out, one of the IPCC models, you know, they they do all of these ranges it, when they, they look at combinations of their models, do ranges and estimate essentially the same parameters I'm, I'm forecasting. And I do comparisons, and I come out, I, I think, sort of really pretty close to where they come out. Mm. But I do it in such a, a much more simple and understandable way that it's like it's night and day to me. So, And I'm, I have a high degree of confidence in the data, and I'm using, again, the best forecasting I can, which is pretty darn good, actually. It's a, it's a fairly modern up up-to-date time series forecasting methodology. And, and so I'm very, I think I have a high degree of confidence in, in, my, in my results, uh, conditional on not having tipping points, right? When, if tipping points occur, it's going to get worse. Mm. So I, I just stop there, Phil. I just say, this is bad enough, folks. <laughs> we, we had better, we had right. better solve, we had better change. And, I, and when I get in front of uh, economists who are degrowth or zero growth economists, and they're 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 howling at me over what I'm saying, frankly, because I say we're not we're not going to stop per capita growth. Uh, you're just not going to do it. Tell me how you're going to do that. You got to go kill the people or have major recessions to stop that yeah. growth. Mm-hmm. Well, right. so does that mean so what you're saying is when we drive electric vehicles and we say we're not going to burn coal anymore, we're going to use less energy generally or we're going to eat no. less meat so there's fewer methane producing cows yeah. you're saying that doesn't make any difference no I, it does make a difference everything does make a difference but all Not of enough. the differences that we've uh, that we've accomplished so far to date that are in the data don't affect the long run sufficiently at all we're still screwed in the, in the you know in, in the short to medium run so we won't get to nirvana because we'll fry and that's what's led me to you know i've uh, uh I've sort of been forced into looking at uh, true uh, alternative energy sources that are different than what we have in the current renewable fleet, you know, the wind and and solar energy and some of the other technologies that are in the current renewable fleet, because all of those are in my data and they're not making enough of a difference. And as an economist, I know why there's not enough price differential. Right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that's partly it. I mean, the, the other thing is that these have got a very low energy return and energy invested. That's correct. That, that's that's probably the major issue. And and by the way, the current fleet of renewables is extremely low energy density. It takes a great deal, which is part of the return. Yeah. It takes a great deal of physical space in order to generate sufficient output. And that's not going to be sustainable in the long run, right? But they would become more viable, and we can t- look at what those sources of energy might be, but presumably they would become more viable if your model or models like it were actually used by economists uh, developing so. developing their patterns for the future. But the, the problem that you've, you've got a president in the United States who thinks it's all a, a hoax brought about by China to try and slow down the West, and you know the Australian right. Prime Minister's not far behind. Uh, right. you know, we've got all these climate change deniers making decisions. But if, if, if it was accepted... Uh, and we had central banks, for example, uh, looking at uh, all of this data as an input to, to managing the economy. Um, and treasurers doing the same thing. We would take a, a very different a- approach to all of this. And, we'd, and all of those other sources of energy, if there's no choice, uh, would all of a sudden become affordable. 
or become considerable. Well, they they could yeah. you know they could be subsidized sufficiently. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. However, see, my approach is actually I've evolved my approach, and, and it's quite different today. I, what I've done, uh, more or less in parallel with developing this model over the last seven or eight years, is look at at the physics, the new physics, potential physics in uh, energy sources. And there's some very interesting things going on there. Now, I might just dive in here quickly, by the way, because I'm interested in some of this stuff as well. But this is one of the areas where we're getting into, into quite non-mainstream physics. I'm very happy with non-mainstream economics. <laughs> that, all aware of that. Listen, this you've got a mainstream s- physics. So let's uh, stick in. You've had us all min- taking minerals off the moon. So uh, yeah, I know. Okay, fair enough. Asteroids. <laughs> get it right. Asteroids. Asteroids. I, I do okay. beg your pardon. And some centuries away, and using rockets. But let's go to. But those. it sounds like this is our only choice. I'm interested in all of this. Where do we? Well, get our yeah, energy it, from. It is. I'm saying just a little caveat there. One, let's, let's start with the conventional to the less conventional. Let's rule some of the things out. Okay. Okay. So we've, we've said one of the issues with... with you, uh, wait a minute. Phil, you can tell I've got Steve Keen a little nervous here. <laughs> I know. I'm, I mean, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm just I'm thinking just how off the wall are these ideas going to be if Steve Keen is uh, putting a caveat associated with them. Okay. So let's, so let's, start, let's, let's start with the basic the thing about solar and wind is is that the very low density of the energy and the need to actually you know, if you've ever gone past some of the uh, new uh, wind turbines they're you know 80 meters tall of concrete so mm. to actually make them takes carbon to begin with on a grand scale uh, and then when you look at the energy return and energy invested it started very low something the order of five times as much energy back for the energy of constructing them they're slowly climbing but they're coming from a very low cliff so that's one problem at the other extreme uh, you can say well what's what are high density energy sources that we haven't yet exploited and here steve and i are in complete agreement i think on the potential for thorium reactors uh, and potentially also yep. maybe maybe uh, some uranium reactors i love a lot of my patrons are engineers working in the nuclear power space, they're, they're, they're saying uranium is reasonably okay. Some of the saying thorium is much better. Mm. But if you do thorium, then that imp- implies a high density, uh, very high return in energy invested uh, way of replacing the carbon-based stuff that we use right now. So that's, 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 those are sort of, that's, that's inside the conventional science world, but not, as yet not properly engineered. So then? So, so and, and the issue, and, and I know, uh, uh, experts in the field, in, in the fission field, from government and, and uh, academia, and they're they're almost totally against developing future fission sources, whether it's thorium or whatever. And their argument is, look, the costs are just not there. Mm. Y- your 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 cost is too high. And, and disposal obviously is the is the big you well, know, public and, concern. <clears throat> Right, and the non-proliferation issues that arise from the the. Waste. No, we'd like to have a debate on Discord over this because there are some people who are strong fans of thorium yeah. in the in the in the Patreon uh, community. Yeah, I'm, yes, and and they they say that thorium is ex- actually extremely low. Uh, I've, I've seen this. There's actually saw a recent YouTube video of a company, I think actually based in the Netherlands, that was attempting to build thorium nuclear reactors, which could fit in a, literally in a forty foot long container and would generate 50 megawatts of power. Yeah. And they actually talk about community nuclear power systems, which it does, and they also say that the waste elements coming out of a thorium reactor have a half-life of 300 years versus the tens of thousands of years of half-life coming out of uh, uranium-based reactors. And also they say they can actually use these reactors to uh, degrade the plutonium waste into something which also has half lives of 300 right. years. So right. uh, there, there are arguments that are the other extreme saying no. thorium could be. I, I, the well, come on, get on, get on to the more crazy ideas. I want to hear them. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You're, you're, no, I'm sitting well, back. Okay. I'll, I'll make some comments, but it's all Steve here. Okay, so, so, uh, so uh, my belief is that uh, that even thorium is, as you know, as as much of an improvement as it probably is over current fission technologies is still going to be too high priced. To, to really cause a, a, a displacement of carbon. Carbon, as long as the price differential isn't sufficient, India is still going to go with coal or somebody. That's is, a good right? argument. And, and so my view has been, let's find a really cheap clean source, a really cheap clean source, like an order of magnitude or even two or more orders of magnitude cheaper than anything that's available out there now. And if you're going to do that, you have to go off into physics and you have to go off into non-mainstream physics, frankly, because mainstream physics does not support 
some of the experimental work that's been done for the last, well, for quite a while, at least the last three or four decades. And there you get some very interesting possibilities. And I, I think we, you know, both Steve Keen and I, I should back up a, a hair here and talk about uh, the current fusion work that's going on, the hot fusion work that's been going on for 40 years at the bill of, I don't know how many billions of dollars around the world with ETER and Tokamak and all of those that don't appear to be any closer to real results. So that, that appears to be a bit of a, a fantasy, frankly. It's not even fantasy. Yeah. You know? So, so if that's not going to work, where do you go? And I have uh, spent quite a bit of time looking at the physics and working with uh, experimenters in the field. Can I just I say, th- this is the biggest buildup ever. It's, <laughs> I, I'm sitting on the edge of my chair well, here. I, I mean, because <laughs> they, 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 this, some of this stuff is going to sound, it's quite, you know, Come on, come on. I'm, 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 on the edge, I'm so far on the edge of my seat, I'm about to fall off. <laughs> okay, well, well we, we're, we're trying your patience here. So, um, so l- l- I'm going to start, just start with um, actually the institution that I'm at right now, which is the University of Utah. And uh, 30, what, 31 years ago, I guess now, or 30 years ago now, uh, at the University of Utah, there were two uh, scientists, Stan Pons and Martin Fleischman, who made an announcement to the world, uh, and pretty much the whole world was there, in, in the Henry Iron Chemistry Building on the campus of the University of Utah, about what? About cold fusion. So, um, they were um, pretty quickly um, excommunicated from mainstream science exiled to France and uh, actually put up in quite nice style in France by, uh, by the Toyota family of Toyota Motors who built a lab so they could continue their research. So there were people that did believe. And, and, there, were, and there have been scientists around the world that have been doing, you know, experimenting in that space, in the cold fusion space. The, the attraction of cold fusion is very high energy density at essentially room top temperature and pressure conditions. So it has all the attraction of fission without all any of the waste byproducts or things like that, or any, any bad radiation output and so forth. So it was very, very potentially attractive. It's just very difficult to uh, initially reproduce those experiments. And that's what partly what got Fleischmann and Ponce. But other scientists have kept up, up the work since then and are having, uh, I think, actually increasingly good results to the point where there are I know of three U.S. companies that are in the process of commercializing, and I'm, I'm probably missing some. I think there are probably more by now. This technology going to market. They're, they're, they're in the development phase to get this technology to market. One company actually has, um, what is it, 21, I think it's 21 kilowatt heat reactor on customer sites, on paying customer sites. So uh, it, it, it appears to be a step in a real step in the right direction. High so, density. So how does it work? So it's like it's yeah. like nuclear fusion, but obviously yeah. uh, much lower temperatures. Yes. So so the, the challenge in any fusion, you know, you're, you're trying to fuse two uh, hydrogen uh, atoms, right, yeah. to release energy, create helium and so forth. Um, is is getting over the so-called Coulomb barrier, which is the repulsive barrier based on the charges at the atomic level. And and that's what hot fusion attempts to do. It att- attempts to create conditions where that is overcome and these atoms are, are smashed together. They, they overcome the Coulomb barrier and, and create the reaction you desire. And and cold fusion uh, appears to do that. All the, all the, the scientific experimental evidence is it does the same thing except with no high pressure and no high temperature. In fact, it creates a lot of heat, right? But it doesn't need heat in order to, um, in order to accomplish the, the, um, the reaction. And, and there are various mechanisms. There's still not settled theory. That's another part of the problem on how exactly this all works. It's new science, new physics. Um, I, I have my own preferred explanation, theoretical explanation, based on, on the physicists that I work with. But it's it's just as controversial as the next guys. I don't know if you want to hear all of that. But well, we better hear it. I think yeah, let's have a listen. Yep. <laughs> all right. Okay. So 
the, the, the new modern physics, the 21st century physics, which is an extension of the older physics, the mainstream physics of, of the you know, 20th century, uh, incorporates some new mathematics. So, well, it's not actually new mathematics, it's old mathematics going back to 1920. But it's the same mathematics that, that uh, theoretical physics uses you know, everywhere, mainstream does, called differential geometry. The uh, ge differential geometry was actually started, I guess, in the 19th century, probably mid-19th century, and used, for example, by Einstein when he did his relativity work. And it was sufficient, that geometry was sufficient to describe the curvature of space-time that Einstein incorporates in his theory, right? And uh, But in, in the 1920s, a probably... Uh, probably, maybe, the best uh, mathematician of the 20th century, Eli, a French uh, mathematician, Eli Cartan, completed, mathematically completed, differential geometry. And it is the standard geometry that everyone engineering science uses today. Now, the difference between the Cartan and the prior was Cartan incorporated what's called a torsion component or, or term. So, Einstein had the curvature, Cartan added torsion or spinning, okay? And that completes differential geometry. So you can, de you can develop explanations of, um, complete explanations of physical systems that are very complex in four-dimensional space-time, for example, using this geometry. Now, the, the, the incredible irony is that most physicists do not use the torsion term. They acknowledge it and then they throw it away. <laughs> Modern 21st century physics, in my opinion, is going to incorporate that. And I know the people that are doing the theoretical work. In fact, that's why I'm going to Wales at the end of this, this trip I'm on right now. But uh, at, once you do that, once you incorporate that term, a whole bunch of new physical properties are possible, including the coupling through resonance reactions because of the spin term. Uh, to the background energy fields that exist everywhere, everywhere, everywhere in the universe. This comes, this is actually something that I have some exposure to just yeah. through my old uh, physics. Uh, it's called the, it's called the zero, zero point sort of energy. And what this is, is if you, if you think about the, the quantum mechanical nature of reality and virtual particles coming into existence, uh, which, which we've experimentally confirmed, if you have two plates of metal that are very close together, then what happens is only waveforms that are harmonic within that range of those two plates can come, can exist. Therefore, at the outside, any range of, of, uh, of, of, of wave functions can exist. So what you can measure, and this has been done in experiments, the is, 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 is a pressure that actually pushes those plates together from what's called zero-point energy. Yeah. So what it's talking about is exploiting this particular thing. Now, whether you can exploit it, that's where we get into Correct. how mm -hmm. you're defining the second law of thermodynamics and right. so on. But, but assuming that this, you can uh, set up uh, experimental conditions to, to invoke this, this reaction, this coupling, this resonant coupling with the background field, then you can draw energy from that background field and use that energy to overcome the Coulomb barrier. That's one theory. That's my favorite theory. There are some others out there that in incorporate tunneling through the Coulomb barrier, which get pretty exotic. There are others that figure out how to reduce the Coulomb barrier. So there's a lot of work going on theoretically, but my favorite is you just you get enough energy to overcome it from the background field. Right, but no one's done it. So it's all uh, still theoretical well, at this stage. Well, well, people, if we're getting, if, if you believe that cold fusion uh, experiments are scientifically viable, that they're correct, which I totally believe they are, I think that's incontrovertible at this point, then, then nature is doing it <laughs> with the help of the experimental setups of people like Fleischmann and Pons. So, so experimentally, it's been happening, right? The, the question is uh, getting to replicate it. Yeah. Well, How do you understand right. it too? Because like the, the double plate. So this is this could have been the the the, the uh, zero point energy experiment could have been done by accident in the nineteenth century. That's correct. Because people correct. could have two plates together and found, my God, we're measuring pressure here. Where the hell is it coming from? That's exactly what happened. In fact, all mm. of all of these effects came out of experiments that were anomalous according mm. to to mainstream physics, and that that's 
And I mean, that's really the history of, of science. So that's not, it shouldn't be too surprising. So that, that is, that is one source. And there are estimates that if we did get to this particular energy source, it would be 600 times up to say 600 times cheaper than anything we have available now per unit of energy. Right. And that would get us out of the tight spot of the world ending. Yep. Uh, yep. Through climate, through climate right. change, no, not through it, space it, distinction necessarily. Right. Well, question. then you then you have to invoke the Jevons paradox and figure that out. You know, figure out the the the, the, the store or the the problems that cascade off of solving the energy problem and therefore increasing outputs. So. Yeah, which I mean, which is a uh, it's a big. I mean, this is uh, just, so you're saying you know that there needs to be something which hasn't been replicated yet. That uh, no, no, it has been. But I want to be yeah. very clear. Yeah. It's been replicated actually probably thousands of times now, including by several components of the U.S. government, the Russian government, Japanese universities, the Chinese, and on and on. It's been re it's being replicated di daily. One point that you should make here is the Nature article. Yeah. And uh, just last week, um, Nature magazine uh, published an article um, that wasn't, it, it said, it, well, it's, it's an article about a research effort that's been funded by Google for the last four years, bringing together a, a new researchers, researchers that were not in the cold fusion space for, uh, you know, f for the last 30 years, brand new researchers and said, okay, go run experiments. Let's try to get results and replicate. And they have not been successful. Now, they haven't been successful because they took a clean sheet approach, it appears, and they didn't take anyone else's input that's been in the field. And there, you know, there's certain methodologies. I mean, given if I had enough patience and had a little bit of money, not very much, I could replicate one of these experiments. It just takes time mm -hmm. and you know, a proper lab setup. Right? Yeah. You can do this. This, this is not a what, what is needed in that sense is not the uh, thing to what Steve is saying here is if we realize the crisis we face, then we should be throwing a large amount of money Absolutely. at alternative energy research, even if it, you simply say, look, that's got to be wrong. So it might be wrong, but where we're headed, we've got to find something that works. And we simply have to, to experiment on a grand scale to work this out. So, Phil, have we gotten you away from the edge of your seat? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm firmly back. My bottom right. is firmly back in the <laughs> middle more. of the seat now. So, <laughs> so, so, and look, I mean, it's all interesting stuff, and we have run out of time to yeah. today. But there's uh, more. There's more. <laughs> oh, there's more. Uh, that was well, that was only I, the moderately crazy one, was it? That, was, that so, was only the moderately crazy. But we don't have time, so you know, maybe we can do it again. <laughs> yeah, well, it'd be good to catch up at some point. I mean, I, I think the message is, yes, we do need to invest in, in alter alternative technologies because the, the model as it stands, the economics just don't add up. That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. Well, great talk, great talking to you. Have a good time in Wales. I'm not quite Thank sure you. how the – I haven't, still haven't figured out the cold fusion Welsh connection, <laughs> apart from the fact that it is cold in Wales. And uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe that's all you need. Uh, but we'll catch you again next time you're in town. Good to talk. Thanks so much. It was Thanks a pleasure. So. There we are. Steve Bannister and Steve Keen. We're all wondering now, what is the blah, 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 crazy idea? Uh, the really crazy one. Uh, look, next time, uh, the EU. Is it anti-growth? Back to just Steve Keen on that one. Join us for that. That's the next edition of the Debunking Economics Podcast. I'm Phil Dobby. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.